you, Luis. You actually saved us from and your fellow students from not, I'll repeat that that for the sake of other students. Okay, so this is and what I'll do a, as a favor to all the students who can join us because of course I only want to give them equal uh, equal is uh, when, after you guys leave I will keep recording and go back to that first slide. So luckily uh, they won't miss that. And thank you, Luis. I have to tell you, I appreciate what you did for your fellow students because I didn't know that. Okay, I'm just going to make sure, right, that the record, the recording should be on now. Yeah, I know I hit it, but I probably didn't hit it hard enough. You know, that, that, that's a warning to me to hit it twice every time I usually do. Okay, let's start over briefly. I will briefly summarize the meaning of this David, this statue of David, again, is the title, by Bernini right, and it's 1623, is a Baroque piece of sculpture commissioned by one of the popes. And the popes of, of the Catholic Church gave Bernini most of his commissions for sculpture and fountains, mostly. And this piece uh, is a Baroque piece because of the features that mark it as Baroque. So just briefly summarizing again, that would be the intense emotion. You see he's looking at Goliath, who of course he's about to kill, uh, and he has, I would just say, the uh, intense emotion of determination. You know, he has to defeat Goliath with one sling uh, uh, sh shot, right? And then, of course, the unseen presence, obviously, is Goliath, right? Which you don't see, but you can tell he's somewhere in front of David. And then we have the bulbous shape, so his muscles, his hair. This is that kind of hair Bernini made into these... Uh, funny bulbous rounded shapes that isn't even very lifelike and realistic, but it gives you some idea of uh, why he used that as its Baroque technique of bulbous rounded shapes, of course, are part of what makes things Baroque. And then we have <clears throat> the um, encrustation of ornamentation, the fourth feature of all Baroque art, and that would be the ornamental carved detail of, of on this uh, breastplate here. And to some degree, on his uh, hair too. So there's extra decorative detail carved into the piece, which is the, the fourth feature again of all Baroque art, uh, an encrustation of ornamentation. Okay, let's do the formal analysis, which we, we hadn't done before. It's a cool white color. Uh, it's dynamic. Look at him, he's, he's in motion. In fact, remember that uh, Bernini said, so I'll repeat this, for those who are watching the recording, that this uh, Bernini described this moment in time that he was recording or co copying, you know, capturing, but we're capturing with, with, with his sculpture as action, right? Mid, sorry, mid action. In other words, David was in the middle of his action to kill, his act of killing. So it's a pose in, in action. And of course, that's going to be dynamic. It's, he's not standing still thinking. He's, he's in the middle of the battle. Okay, and then we have the rhythm of the arms, hands, feet, legs, and so forth. Uh, we have uh, similar texture, of course, of the robes, again, his hair, the armor below, and the real smooth texture of the marble. It's balanced, even though he's in motion. Obviously, it's an intact human figure with all the parts you know, so left to right and top to bottom, <clears throat> it is balanced. Uh, and then we have um, the largest mass is him, of course. Then the armor, if you count the helmet as part of it because it's attached in this view. And then the slingshot. <clears throat> and then we have for space, it's a life-size figure. It's about six feet tall, I've seen it. So it's a life-size figure of an adult man about six feet tall and there is overlapping, it's the only technique for space, uh, right? Uh, with his uh, clothes over his body, his hand over the slingshot, and his legs over the armor. And then finally, we have the um, <clears throat> lack of modeling. You'll see shadows, but that's from the museum lighting, so there is no technique for modeling. All right, so let's move on to the next must know. Okay, uh, this next one is the Church of Saint Agnes. A-G-N-E-S-E. -E. And it's uh, by another architect who was Bernini's rival. There's quite a story to that, and we'll get to it in a minute. But let me spell his last name for you. I'm sorry, these Italian last names can be very long. Boromini 
it's fairly phonetic if you say it slowly and pronounce it correctly, but I'll spell this twice for you. B O double R O M I N I 1657. Boromini, B O R R O M I N I. Who was he? Let's start with that. The church is in the middle, and we're going to go up close to it. And if it's on the test, you'll have a view that's directly head on. But I want you to see the setting. And it's a, now so you st start taking the notes for the meaning. Boromini was one of Bernini's assistants during the project on the colonnade of St. Peter's. And for those of you who um, are watching this as a recording, I'm just giving you a heads up. Uh, the first slide didn't get recorded. So I am going to do that must know uh, at the end of the lecture, I'll restate the meaning and the uh, formal analysis of the colonnade of St. Peter's. But if you're uh, watching it as a recording and or now, <laughs> all of you watching it live, all you have to, to, to add now about who was Borromini, he had been one of the assistants that warned Bernini against making those towers uh, too tall and too heavy, the ones that collapsed when they were being built on the, at the corners of St. Peter's Church. So he warned, uh, Borromini warned his, uh, his, uh, his boss. I mean, it was his boss. And guess what? Bernini did not like to be told he was wrong. He was an egomaniac. He was a genius and an egomaniac. Uh, and he uh, fired Borromini. I mean, maybe not all at once, but overnight, but eventually he encouraged him to leave. So Borromini then went on off on his own and started his own architecture practice in Rome and became the main rival of Bernini. And it cost him his life. I am not exaggerating. It's a tragedy, like an ancient Greek tragedy. I'll say why. So here we go. Let's first now talk about the church itself. This is the view you'll have if it's on the exam. I'm not saying, for instance, that this slide is so important that um, I won't maybe cut it, but it, it's pretty important. Again, you, uh, you won't know until we do the review the week before the midterm what slides I'm going to keep on that list for you to you know, study uh, that might be on the test and which ones I'm remo removing. Okay, so this view shows you the features that mark it as broke. Well, Let's do them one by one. There are four by now. You should start to be familiar with them. Bulbous shapes. Well, look, the whole building is full of bulbous shapes. I mean, even these little niches here. Let's go up close. You see that? That bows out is the saying, or uh, you know, curves outward. And then this curves inward. And then and then uh, it curves back out again on this side. The dome, of course, itself is bulbous, and even the the columns, they're, they're kind of clustered, you know, and then the, the, the um, finials, these, that's what these are called. You'll have to know that word. The tops of these two towers here are, you know, obviously rounded, especially the base. So it's full of bulbous rounded shapes. Second is the encrustation of ornamentation. Well, that's visible at the top. Well, actually on both levels, there, there are two levels, these towers, right? Let's go up there. You can see that, and then at the top of each column, and then here above the entrance. So it definitely has an encrustation ornamentation. Churches before this, earlier churches in Rome, wouldn't have had that much decoration. Wait till you see the interior. I'll show it to you in just a few minutes. Okay, so you have an encrustation of ornamentation across much of the facade or exterior. All right, the third feature would be, it's probably obvious, the unseen presence is God, as it should be with any you know, Catholic or Christian church, you're supposed to feel his presence if you are a devout Christian when you walk inside the church, of course, or even before you enter it. And then the final feature, the intense emotion, you could probably guess is you're supposed to be your religious devotion or faith that you feel this powerful faith that the building, the design of it helps, you know, enhance or, or strengthen your religious beliefs because it's so beautiful. Okay, but there's a little more to the meaning and the design or style of it. And this is maybe the most important thing about this uh, meaning of this slide, other than that who Bernini was, sorry, I meant Borromini, I apologize, that he had started his career as an assistant to Bernini and then left after that disaster with the collapsed towers or the towers, one tower. All right, so what is the final thing about the meaning? 
Borromini invented a whole new style or type, you could say type, of Baroque church architecture that can be found all over the world. And I am not exaggerating. I'll describe it. Here are the features. So there's like three. One is an undulating facade. I know that is an odd concept to you, but I kind of already described it. The facade, that is, you should all know that word by now, it'll definitely come up on the exam, both exams, the midterm and the final. That's the exterior of a building, the facade, right? Here it's flat, then it bulbs out, you know, pooches out, however you want to say, curves outward, then it curves inward. Whoops, I'm sorry. Didn't mean stop that and then it comes back out again you get the idea it's constantly in motion there's no flat planes on this facade except maybe just the bottom corners here uh everywhere you look all the way up the tower the same thing out in back out back in between the rows of columns you get the idea and on the towers the same thing right so again one of the features invented by Bormini that is a feature of many Baroque churches that were influenced by him around the world, <laughs> literally not just in Italy, is an undulating, you know, two words, facade or exterior, if you prefer that word. Another feature is a large central dome with a tall, narrow cupola. A, a, a uh, sorry, I meant to say tall, I apologize, a tall, central dome with a tall narrow cupola okay that is a little bit similar but it isn't the same exactly it's much more narrow and tall proportionately than even michelangelo's dome of saint peter's but the the feature that marks it, it is totally different than any previous version of baroque is the flanking towers on either side right literally symmetrically placed flanking is the word with a k of course flanking towers on either side of the dome i can prove that if i had time i'd show you my own slides of havana cuba the ca the cathedral in havana which of course it was now it's an atheist country because it's a communist uh, country they don't allow well they do they do allow people to go to church now but they didn't for years uh, i've been to cuba more than once that cathedral it looks like a, sm a slightly smaller version of this and it's about 100 years later and it, clearly the architect who came from spain had seen some of Borromini's work which was already all over europe this type of feature these three features i just mentioned the undulating facade one more time and then we'll do a formal analysis uh the um a tall, narrow dome with a tall, narrow cupola and the flanking, these are bell towers, you could just say that, flanking bell towers. All of those put together are Borromini's version of Baroque and people like that so much. So guess what that did? The last part of the meeting is it caused great resentment among his former boss or, or you know, from his former boss, I should say. Uh, Bernini hated Borromini for the fact that he was becoming an even more successful architect than Bernini had ever been and was getting a lot of commissions, including from the Pope. So for now, that's enough on the meaning. There's one more slide of the Borromini church, and that's when I'll tell you what happened to him and why it cost him his life, that rivalry. But we'll get to that. Let's now wrap up this one with a formal analysis. Completely symmetrical, almost all Baroque architecture is. Identical towers, right, evenly placed. But of course, weighted toward the bottom, right? Obviously, this bottom half is wider, thicker than the, the uh, dome and the two towers. Uh, it is full of the rhythm, of course, of the windows, the columns, the two towers, everywhere you look. Uh, the sculpture, right? I see that up close. That's, I think that's supposed to be a saint's head. I can't remember now. I, I was here once, but it was 20 years ago. Okay, so there's a lot of rhythm, obviously, in all architecture from uh, Baroque and earlier times. Repeated shapes everywhere. Uh, the texture is the real smooth texture of stone. And the only little bits of cement texture you can't see, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, so there is some carved line here, though, for the decorations, the encrusted ornament or encrustation of ornament. So there's carved line, not painted line. There's modeling again, but only as the effect of the sun, the shadows from the sun, of course. Uh, for space, the dome is about 100 
uh, not quite. It's actually it's closer to 90 feet. Yeah, it's about 90 feet high. You're going to see the inside of it in just a minute. Uh, and then two towers about 80 feet high. It's not quite as tall as a dome. And when you add the cupola, it's over 100 feet. That's what the width. So to say it's a large open domed room with about a 90 foot high ceiling. Um, <clears throat> all right. And then uh, that's real space. Of course, there's no techniques for space. The color, th this is misleading. I'm going to go back to my slide of it. That's not my slide. This is. I took this. You see the color? It's bright, blinding white marble. So, of course, that's a cool color. It just the pollution. Rome is a city of 8 million with a lot of cars and buses. So the pollution has turned it kind of, and plus the slide is kind of discolored. It's not my slide, but it was what we had. The slide library has the only view of it head on. So that's why I'm using it. And the real color you just have to write is, is white and therefore totally cool. Okay. And the largest mass, well, it would be the dome if you include the drum, right? The base of the dome or even the whole thing, including the cupola, that definitely would be the largest mass. Uh, and then I would say the entry section, right? Around the, the door, the front door right there. Uh, or you can say the two towers, if you count them as, as full mass, because actually they are. So maybe you should, yeah, that's better. The dome is the largest mass, then each of the two towers are the second largest, and then the entry section, just around the edges of the doorway is the third largest. Okay, I don't think I'm forgetting anything. Balance, rhythm, right? Texture, modeling. Um, okay, let's take a break from note taking and let's go inside this. And you don't have to take notes for the next four slides or so. Okay, just watch. If you're from California, aren't, isn't everybody here now at least a resident of California at, at this point? And you can just say that when you're in a foreign city, a foreign country, a foreign city, it can sometimes give you entree or entrance to places you would never get into otherwise. I'll prove that to you. The day I took these slides was my last day in Rome. I was there for two weeks taking photos and interviewing people for articles and newspapers. I was lucky I got sponsored. I mean, someone else paid for the trip. The city of Rome tourism office or something like that. Anyways, you know, many years ago. So I was enjoying myself, but this church was something I had been wanting to see because I was already teaching this class and I had already been showing that last slide of it. So I want to go inside of it, but it was closed. Every time I went by, it said, you know, come back tomorrow in English and Italian sign on the front door. Finally, on the last day, the same sign was hanging out and all these tourists uh, like me that wanted to go in, banged on the door, and some guy stuck his head out of the front door. And I think I have a close up of it. No, I don't. I have that's actually the uh, the the fountain by Bernini in front of it. But anyway, this the the head of the contracting crew, the crew working on restoring it. You can see they were working on it. They were cleaning the facade. They were repainting the dome, and repairing cracks. You know, just just repairing in general. Uh, so that crew the head of that crew stuck his head out of the door and cursed at us in Italian, told us all to go away. Can't you see the sign, you know? So everyone else left. Uh, there was like 20 tourists besides me on the steps and they all went away, and melted into the crowd. I waited about five minutes till they were all out of sight. And then I decided to knock on that door again. You have a big brass knocker, all these churches do. And the guy got so mad because he, it was the second time someone interrupted his work. Well, actually, he was having lunch. <laughs> and he stuck his head out of the door and said in Italian, uh, no, I'm sorry, in English. That's right. He spoke some English. He said, hey, I already told you, go away. What, what's the matter with you? And I said, it, I studied Italian enough to say in Italian, uh, scuse, signore, il soy professore de architettura de Berkeley, California. Suddenly he said, California, I love California, the Golden Gate Bridge, Disneyland, come in, come in. Those were the magic words, and this is why it was worth that. Look at this dome. There's nothing like it anywhere in Rome. Those are the encrusted ornamental details, not painted personally by Bormini. Of course, he wasn't a painter, but he hired the artist and he designed. Look at that. That's like supposed to be the light of God. I just, this was so beautiful inside. You can see why Bernini was jealous of Borromini. His former assistant was outdoing him. Okay, let's get to the next must know now, and then I think we'll take a break. No, actually, we, we'll take a break at eight like we used to do. So we'll do two more muscles. Okay, the next must know is 
uh, the Church of San Carlo, also by Borromini, I always spell his name, B-O-R-R-O-M-I-N-I. -R -R -I. And the date is 1667. Okay, so 10 years later, Borromini's career, now this is the meaning, you should be taking notes on this. And uh, it isn't as long as the meaning for the last one because you already know who Borromini was, but you should add these facts. By the time he designed this church, Borromini had become the most popular and successful architect in Rome, and that made Bernini hate him and want revenge. Never mind that Borromini never did anything to deserve, but that's how some people are, you know, when they're really full of their own ego. So he decided to ruin Borromini's career. When this church was designed, he had the chance, Bernini had the chance, I'll repeat this, to design this very church. The Catholic Church asked him to design a narrow church on the narrowest lot in Rome. Think about that. That's a challenge for any kind of building. But an entire church, it's supposed to hold hundreds of people. He laughed and said, get out of here. Now he did whatever he said in Italian. He just said he rejected that uh, offer from the Catholic Church to design a church. Bernini did. Borromini said, I'll do it. And he created the narrowest church in all of Rome maybe all of Italy, but certainly all of Rome. It's only a 25 foot wide lot. Think about how narrow that is. Most residential lots are at least 50 feet wide for little bungalows like the one I live in. Um, so nobody else thought that they could do it, including Bernini, that anyone could do it. Uh, Borromini created a masterpiece. This building is another fact in the meaning. is studied by every successful architect. In fact, Frank Gehry, you've heard of him, right? The most famous architect in the world now, right? And before him, the other Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright, had gone to this church when they were young architects to study it. It's taught the design, the story behind it, the, the features are taught in architecture programs all around the world. It's that important because of what he did here. He created a masterpiece on the narrowest lot in Rome, or at least the narrowest church lot. And it has those undulating facades that we talked about. You see that, look at this. And here's a, a priest. The one who actually commissioned the church wasn't the Pope this time. It was the head priest of Franciscan. You know, the city of San Francisco was named after St. Francis. So that's probably supposed to be St. Francis or, or, or current um, Franciscan. Uh, priest. And here are angels, you know, in their wings. You see the encrustations of ornamentation, of course. And then the unseen presence here would be, of course, as always with the church god. Uh, and then let's see, I think I'm going to go back to the full view because th this is from the slide library. Obviously, it's a very old black and white slide. You cannot get a photo of it now. There's too much traffic and signage in front of it. I tried with my camera and you just can't. So I have to use this black and white photo. All right. So the undulating facade is obvious. The bulbous shapes are everywhere, right? But that's part of what makes it Baroque. And then you have, you don't see the other bell tower, but it's there on the other side. You can barely see a little tiny bit of it peeking up. And there's your central, uh, that's the cupola above a central dome. But let's go inside and see how he solved the problem of the narrowest dome in the narrowest church in Rome. Or you could just say the narrowest dome in Rome. Okay. That dome is mind boggling. No one guesses the truth. When they look at this dome, they think that it's about 60 feet above your head. I did too, but I knew better because I'd read about it before I went to see it. It's only 35 feet above your head. He created an optical illusion. No one else had ever done that of a building with a much higher ceiling than it actually had. And this is really one of those, you know, remarkable things that he was able to achieve that on this tiny narrow lot in a narrow building. So this was a masterpiece. And as soon as it was opened, all of Rome was applauding this building. And of course, Borromini, the architect. So guess what happened? Here's the last part of the meaning, the part about what happened, the tragedy uh, that cost Borromini his life. Bernini went behind his back and black listed him. You know what that is, right? You've all heard of blacklisting. <laughs> it still happens sometimes. It happened in this country in the 50s, you know, right? So just say that he decided that the Pope and everyone working for the Catholic Church who had the money and power to commission new buildings should never hire Borromini again. He demanded that, or I, Bernini, will never design another site for you. So when they were faced with that choice, their most famous 
favorite architect who had already built dozens of buildings and fountains and sculptures for them was not going to keep doing it unless they, in essence, blacklisted. There's no other word for it, blacklisted Borromini. So why did it cost him his life? Because he didn't know. It was a mystery to him. All his clients dried up overnight almost, you know, very rapidly. People wouldn't accept his invitations. He was not allowed to attend public events. He ended up losing his income, his you know, architecture practice, his home. He finally ended up renting a small, tiny little garret, you know, on the top floor of some building and could barely feed himself. And out of severe depression, some think he was manic depressive that would have contributed to it. But he was doing OK before Bernini did that to him. He ended up hanging himself. The woman, the landlord that owned the building, found Bernini's body swinging from a rafter in his own apartment out of despair at what had happened to him, never knowing that it was all revenge by Bernini. So to me, that's a despicable act by a fellow. Yeah, isn't that almost like a Greek tragedy or Greek? Yeah. I don't yeah. know about you, but that but it sounds like that Bernini was the was pretty much like a like an unpleasant person. Oh yes, yes. With. Oh, he sliced the face of one of his lovers, ex-lovers, who wasn't even with him, with a oh. razor blade and disfigured her. Yeah, oh, there's all kinds because she was starting to date his younger brother. And it was his own uh. brother, you know. It's like, oh man, yeah, the guy was uh oh, he got away with a lot of stuff he shouldn't have gotten away with. Okay. Wow, sounds so, like yeah, yeah, it sounds like a like a like an exposed celebrity in the modern age. Oh, yes, it does, it does. Yes, there's a holy uh, cow. Th th there's some documentaries. You, I don't. Well, we were running a little late, so I'm going to go ahead and just tell you. You could look up the documentaries on. Um, I think it's called The Power of Art. I'm pretty sure if you looked it up, a documentary on Bernini. He did one on about eight artists. The guy I could think of his name, Simon, but I don't remember his last name. He's a British art historian, and his documentary on Bernini will make your hair stand on end, just like you're saying. I mean, it does sound like a modern scandal, you know, right out of the, the, the news and, the, you know, internet. Uh, but this is 400 years ago. Yeah. Okay. So let's wrap up this and we'll do one more must know and then we'll take a break. Okay. So this is balanced. You can't tell from here, but it is the other tower. You know what? Actually, I think I remember it was, uh, it, it was damaged in an earthquake. That's right. But it was there. This is a slide is from about like 1930 or so, but it's been replaced when I was there. It was, it was there again, that tower. So it is symmetrical, uh, it balanced left to right. And I would say top to bottom, if you do the line here, right. And then there's the rhythm, obviously of all the columns and the curved lines of the undulating facade and the tower, uh, there were two, so let's just say towers and the um, uh, dome and of course cupola above that, all of those shapes are repeated. And there's of course no modeling. Remember with buildings, usually it's just the natural shadows from the sunlight that you see here. And the color is actually a warm color and that unfortunately this slide doesn't show. So you just have to remember, see, it's a pink color of stone though here it almost looks purple. <laughs> I don't know, this slide is just aging. That's 2000, that slide I took it in 2000, when I, last time I was in Rome. Okay, so then anyway, what you see here, it doesn't indicate that, but it is a warm color of pinkish stone. And there is the similar texture of the carved details on the sculpture, of course, which I just showed you, uh, for instance, right here, right? So carved line is used all over the building for the decorations and the sculpture. And that creates simulated texture, but there's also the real smooth texture of marble. It's a pinkish color of marble. For space, the dome is barely 35, it might be 36 feet. So just say under 40 feet. One narrow, I would write it that way, room, the main you know, area inside is one narrow room with about a 35 to 40 foot high dome, which looks 60 feet high. Everyone assumes that. Okay, and it's dynamic. I don't see this hard. The only thing straight here are the columns. So it's almost overwhelmingly dynamic. And the largest mass, will you decide? You can break it down into each of these two halves is about the same, aren't they? Or just the outer walls or the dome and the cupola. But actually, I think these two, uh, two halves of the facade are the largest mass, if you, if you look at it that way. Okay, let's do one more must know. Uh, I'm going to have to skip some things, but I do want to show you this here, uh, because here what you have 
is the fountain. You have to write this, not a must know. You've heard of the Trevi, T-R-E-V-I fountain, where if you throw a coin into it before you leave Rome, you will be certain to return. Well, every time I've been in Rome, I've done that. And I've been to Rome four times. So I guess I've got a fifth trip coming up. So probably take our daughter, you know, after she graduates from high school or something. Not this year, but anyway, so it's a famous fountain. And it was designed by someone way after Bernini and Borromini were both long dead. This was 100 years after they died. But it's such a beautiful fountain. I just wanted to show it to you. It's, it, it's in every movie that's ever been filmed in Rome. Practically, there are scenes in this. In fact, in one famous movie, a famous actress who was a rival of Marilyn Monroe, I thought she was just as popular, though not quite, threw herself nude into the fountain. And that was shocking in 1962 or whenever that movie was made. Okay, this is the next must know. Very important. I'm not cutting this from the study list and then we'll take our break. Uh, this is Maids of Honor. Maids of Honor by Velazquez. V E L A S. Q-U-E-Z, V-E-L-A-S-Q-U-E-Z was his last name. Maids, you know, plural of honor is the title. And the date is 1656. This painting influenced every painter, famous painter, we'll have to say, after it was completed from that century, the 17th century, including Rembrandt and other famous painters of the 1600s. That's the 17th century, of course, is the 1600s. From that century till now, Picasso studied this painting and did a version of it in his Cubist abstract style. And almost every other famous painter from like the 1800s, the Romantic painters, they were called. We aren't going to uh, get, yeah, we will get that far. Yes, we will. So, and even the Impressionists were inspired by it. You might say, what? What's Impressionist about this? Well, just listen. So now, here's what you should be writing. Just say, this painting was very influential to later generations of painters. Keep it simple. It is the first fact about the name. And we'll say how and why in the next several minutes. But the first thing is what's going on here. Well, it's a room in the royal palace of the king's family, the king of Spain, of course. Well, I didn't say that. I should have. I mean, Velazquez, right? It's a Spanish name. So this is the king's family. Uh, it's his daughter, sorry, I meant to say, his daughter. And that's Velazquez, who was the court painter. He was assigned to paint scenes like this. So this is the king's daughter. And then there are the king and queen. There's something odd about this that it, some of you may already start to realize. There's something not natural about the way these different details appear all in the same scene. It's physically impossible for this to happen in the real world, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, just to summarize, the event is minor thing. It's like, you know, the, the king's youngest daughter, there she is, is getting ready, is being dressed by her maids of honor, right, for a big celebration, a ball, you know, a feast that night in the royal palace of the king of Spain. There is the painter, Velazquez. And then here's, of course, a nun and a priest looking on. If you want to know who this is, this is, you know, something that only uh, very wealthy, privileged families, royal especially, would ever even think to do. That is a, uh, uh, a young woman, uh, an adult, who was a dwarf and was uh, taken, literally, I'm sure, just by force off the streets of Madrid, probably homeless, and brought to the palace to amuse this spoiled little princess here, <laughs> literally. And then this is her brother. And look what he's doing. He's abusing that poor dog. At least in my mind, he is. The dog isn't happy. Look at him. So Velasquez is making a comment. That's one of the unusual features of this painting about the behavior, the spoiled brat of a little brother and the whole idea of, you know, making an entertainment, you know, uh, object out of a human being, right? without their consent, you know, but of course the royal family is the king of Spain. They can do whatever they want, right? So he's kind of commenting on, he doesn't look like he's too approving of this either, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. The other features that mark this as very unique, there just is no other painting that does this. These are those features you should write now in the remaining notes on the meaning. The light is coming from four different directions at the same time. There's only one sun on planet Earth, right? And the sun shines a light in a certain direction, one direction. 
look at this as though there was some kind of lighting, which there wasn't back then, artificial lighting or another sun somewhere below the floor reflecting off the ceiling. That's impossible. And then the lights coming from this window on the sides of their faces, but it's also coming from the other direction equally strong it's physically impossible on earth for this to happen and then my favorite thing is the lights coming from both behind us and in front of us in exactly 90 degree uh, uh, angles away from the windows the lights coming down you know spilling as they say splashing the sunlight on the stairs and that is one of the but the, like the head butler they call him a chancellor but whatever he's basically the head of the household uh, of, of the crew, right? He's looking in to make sure everything's going well. The sun's coming and hitting the door. And then the sun has to be coming from behind us because we're looking straight into the room and towards this mirror in the on the back wall. But that's not possible. The sun is, in other words, depicted in this painting. The sun is shown to be coming equally strongly from four different directions, which is a physical impossibility. It's an optical illusion. And then my favorite, this is the last main detail, is there's something weird going on here. If we're standing there and the painter's looking at us, in essence, and so is this poor unhappy young woman here who's captive in the palace, they're looking at us, we're the observer. And we should be seen in the mirror because we're in front of the king and queen. Obviously, we would be in front of them because we don't see them in front of us. You get the point. It's another very, very subtle, but very clever optical illusion. This painting is full of optical illusions and, and no one had ever tried to do this many in one painting. Did you uh, say some, that one more time? Uh, no one had ever tried to do as many optical illusions as are in this painting. You mean the last one about the mirror? Is that what you're asking me to repeat that? Yeah, yeah, the one before that with the king and the queen, because I didn't- Yes, yes, I'll say it again. Sure, sure. Uh, if we, the observers, are standing, you know, on the edge of the room looking in at all this scene, then obviously we're in front of the king and queen, because if we weren't in front of them, we'd see the backs of their heads, right? Right? Just physically, we'd have to. So if they're behind us, where are we in this painting? We are clearly being shown as somehow participating in this scene. Look, he's looking at us. And even she is one of the maids, and certainly this this uh, poor playmate of the <laughs> princess. So it's an it's an optical illusion within an illusion. The the, uh, the four different directions of the sunlight coming into the room that's enough right there to make this a re really remarkable painting. But when you add that little trick of how the mirror doesn't reflect reality, because we should either be seen in the mirror in front of the king and queen, uh, right, or they should be in front of us. Uh, it, it just, it all adds up to a, a tour de force is a phrase, you don't have to know it. It's just considered a masterpiece and, and painters from, like I said, every generation since this time have studied it. And if that's not enough, the last thing is let's look at the little, in fact, actually I have a close up. I have a close up. Yeah, that's actually a better view of it. That's more what the real colors are. But the other one shows you how the light affects the scene better. But I think I have one more view. Yeah, I do. There, look at her hair and the top of her dress from about the apron, that's called the apron, to the bodice, isn't that what that's called? Anyway, the top part of the dress, but especially on her forehead and her blonde hair, her blonde locks, that's impressionist. This is 200 years before impressionism was even experimental. Impressionism came out of the 1860s in, in France. We'll cover that, of course, near the end of this class. Uh, so what you see here, is an early version of a, a, a style that hadn't even been invented for 200 years. Impressionist painters would go to, to Madrid. This is in Madrid. It's at the Prado Museum, which is the third greatest museum of art. I've said that before in the world after the Louvre and the Hermitage in St. Petersburg or what used to be Leningrad, Russia. And then the third largest certainly is, is the one in Madrid. That's where this is. So painters come from all over the world to that museum in Madrid. And, uh, and study this. And, and uh, certainly the Impressionists were aware of this. I'm not saying they were copying it. They had their own ideas. There we go. That shows it even better. You see the way the light's bouncing off her forehead? And I mean, that's that's not what a strictly sharp, realistic uh, impression, uh, sorry, <laughs> Renaissance or Baroque painter would have done. So let's go back to the full view. I think if it's on the exam, uh, yeah, th this actually shows the, the effect of the light better. 
Yeah, actually, that one isn't exactly accurate when it comes to colors. There's a little too much green in it. I've seen this painting more than once. It's it's one I, whenever I'm in Spain, I want to go see it because you just notice these features even more each time you look. Uh, okay, let's wrap up this and take a break. Um, this is balanced uh, left to right, roughly. You know, the, the the wall and the paintings and the easel of the painting he's making, right, of this scene. So there's another optical illusion. He's painting this painting within the painting, but that's that's a minor point. That had been done before, but not all these other things. So it's balanced left to right, roughly, but weighted toward the bottom, clearly unbalanced toward the bottom. There's the rhythm, right, of all the human bodies and the paintings on the wall, obviously. Uh, and then we have strong, realistic, similar textures on the hair, the skin, the clothing, except on the princess's face, or, or forehead at least, and her hair and the top of her dress. There, it's soft and diffused, which of course is what later on Impressionism would do. All over their paintings are all diffused or soft. But here, all the rest of the cement textures and modeling, right, on all the human figures and the objects on the walls are strong and realistic. For space, you've got overlapping, foreshortening, diminishing size, of course, and scientific perspective. The only thing it doesn't have, because it's not an outdoor view, it does not have atmospheric perspective, of course. Uh, is it stable or dynamic? That's a little harder to say. I mean, there's a little bit of dynamic quality to the leaning uh, maids, but she's standing upright. These two figure, well, at least this, uh, the dwarf is. The dog even is kind of sitting and upright and he's standing totally upright. The entire room is, I'd say it's mostly stable with some dynamic details, of course, on the tops of their heads and so couple of the, the bodies there. All right, and then the colors are a mixture of warm and cool. Um, the warm, of course, is on the woodwork, on the doors, uh, and the skin and hair. Uh, but the clothing, well, here we have a little bit of a warm red on the bratty little brother. And Bly, these are satin. These are very fancy clothes, of course, for the world ball that they're going to go to. I don't know if they invited this young woman, who knows? Anyway, she's wearing neutral colors, of course, and as he, the painter, but their skin tones, their hair, that's warm in the floor and this doorway. The rest, uh, it's a mixture. You could say that's cool on the ceiling, kind of a coolish gray color. And uh, her dress, most of the, the three main figures, the maids themselves and the um, princess all have uh, cool color clothing on. The line is all thin, thin outline, of course. Okay, and the largest mass, it's hard to say, but I guess it's a ceiling, if you count that as one mass. And then probably the back wall, and then the edge of the painting, the easel he's painting on, in that order. And of course, there's a rhythm of the human body, so the arms, hands, legs, feet. Okay, it's exactly eight o'clock, so let's take a 15 minute break. We'll end early tonight, and I will stick around. If you're one of those one or two people that join late, I will redo the first slide at the end and uh, of course also stay on to take questions for um, those who are watching this as a recording because it, it didn't get that recorded the colonnade of st peter's okay let's take a 15 minute break actually there'll be 8 16 as of now all right see you all 15 minutes okay welcome back to the second part of uh this lecture on baroque art we're still going to be able to end early, but I know at least I think two people joined us a little late. And also, as I've said, for the sake of those who can't be here tonight because they're you know, in, in another class or working or whatever, I will repeat the first slide. And it might be helpful for some of you who are here even as a refresher uh, at the end of the three new remaining must knows. And then I will stick around even after that to answer any extra last minute questions. OK, so moving on to the next must know. Okay, um, this is Judith and the maid servant. So we have two slides uh, tonight that have the word maid in them. Um, Judith and the maid servant. Gentileshi is the artist and there's a lot to say about her, 1625. Okay, Judith, you, you probably know, but it's J-U-D-I-T-H. And I think you all know how to spell maid and servant, of course. And the artist's last name, I was a woman, Gentileshi, G-E-N-T-I-L, 
E-S-C-H-I, Gentileschi, 1625. Her first name was Artemisia. There's a great movie with just that. Her first name is the title. It's a joint French-Italian movie about how her career started. She was, now you should start writing notes, uh, Gentileschi, you only have to remember their last names, but if you want to write her first name, Artemisia, like it sounds with an E in the middle, Artemisia, was one of the few successful female painters in Europe during her lifetime. There were a handful, maybe, you know, a couple of dozen throughout Europe. And um, one of only uh, uh, two or three in Italy. There might, there might have been as many as five or six, but it was a small number, a very small number of women who were able to break through the, whatever you want to call it, glass ceiling, right, at that time. Oh, the prejudice, obviously, the sexism, that's really the right word that confronted most women who wanted to become full-time successful painters. She was so talented, she was able to be a lifetime successful painter and her work was in demand all over Western Europe. She didn't only uh, paint and live and work and get commissions in Italy where she was from, but she did it other parts of Europe too. I believe Spain, certainly France, and Holland, I think. Yeah, so all over, just say many other parts of Western Europe also. She had patrons, you know, patrons, people hiring her for paintings. However, she also did a lot of paintings on her own to show the empowerment of women. Now, this is 400 years ago. So this depicts a scene from the Bible in which the daughter of the king of Israel named Judith, the one with the shadow across her cheek there, by the way, that's not a strange, <laughs> you know, bit of makeup or gone astray. It's, it's a shadow from, you know, a light, which some people misinterpret we'll get to that in a minute why it's placed where it is but just say that this painting is a scene from the bible in which the daughter of the king of israel snuck into the tent of their enemy's king and she got him drunk you know in other words pretended to, to, to seduce him but didn't let things go that far just say that she you know, engage in seductive behavior, got him drunk, and then cut his head off. That's it right there. Let's get up close. And this is her servant who was with her. They took the head, the severed head of the enemy king back to their own camp, you know, their army's camp. And the next morning, this is all documented in the Bible, and there's some evidence in history that it really happened. They showed, the Israeli army showed the head of the severed enemy king on a pike, stuck it on a pike and showed it to their enemies. And that army panicked, knowing they had no leader and that you know, they, maybe they thought it was magic, whatever, they just ran away. And so that's how Israel then at that point in their history was saved from an invading army by this courageous act by a woman, the daughter of their king. And that's her, Judith. Okay, you see the sword she used? If you looked up, I think we can see a little bit of blood on it. Yeah, there is. I've seen the painting. In, but yeah. In any case, there's the severed head. And she's at a moment of, of uh, attention or, or anxiety uh, when she hears someone outside the tent. She's already succeeded in doing the dirty deed. There we go, right? That's your alliteration. She did the dirty deed already of murdering this, this uh, enemy king uh, <clears throat> to defend her own people, of course. And uh, she hears a noise outside, you know, probably a guard. They obviously, they would have been killed if they were captured. So she escaped and brought that head to her father. And that won the battle. Well, it wasn't even a battle. It, it won the psychological war. You could just say it, it uh, the right word is uh, demoralized. There we go. That's the word, the enemy army, when they found out that, you know, their king had been beheaded the next morning, they just ran away. Okay, but there's more to it than that. How did Gentile she get started is part of this. She was about 14 or 15 when her father, who was a already famous painter in Italy, not today, most people haven't even heard of him. Back then he was a very successful painter. And he could see his daughter had talent from the sketches she made. So he hired a tutor to teach her how to paint, you know, not just draw, but paint. 
you know, with oil and, and, you know, realistic style, all the techniques that Renaissance painter need to know. So he believed in his daughter up to a point, unfortunately for her, his loyalty to her didn't stay uh, with her for throughout her life, because here's what happened. After about a year or less, just say, you know, many months of being tutored by this man who was in his 40s, and she was maybe 16, 15 or 16, I think she was 15. He seduced her or raped her. There's no absolute certainty, but the fact is that it qualifies as rape. Today, there'd be no question if someone did that to someone in their mid-teens with, you know, with obviously uh, coercion and uh, more, you know, power in there. You know, this, I don't have to get political here, but the point is he took advantage of her, probably raped her. So you could just write it that way. And then they were both arrested on the orders of her father, he turned against his own daughter because he somehow believed the former tutor, he'd known that tutor for years before he hired the tutor to teach his daughter, who lied, of course, and said, well, I, you know, she wanted me to be, you know, intimate. She wanted us to become, you know, uh, <clears throat> partners, right, sexual partners, and she denied that. So both of them were tortured. Can you believe this by the Inquisition? <laughs> both of them. She's the victim. Why is she being tortured? And uh, made to confess that they had sinned. Again, did she sin at her age? How could she be considered responsible for the behavior of a, of a man three times her age who took advantage of her? Even if it wasn't exactly rape, it was the equivalent legally of rape. And it should have been even back then. He should have been prosecuted and she shouldn't have. So after the trial... He was convicted, I think he submitted only three years in, in, in prison, and she left her family and never came back. She never spoke to her father again for his disloyalty, and I don't blame her. But she stayed in touch with her mother and would return to Italy just to visit her mother and her uh, other family members. So that's how her career started. By the time she was, what, 16, by the time the trial was over, she had already become a very talented painter and was uh, able to get commissions all over Western Europe. Pretty impressive story. She overcame all that. Okay, that's the meaning on this one. Um, it's very sharp and realistic simulated textures here. Uh, and then we have, of course, the uh, rhythm of the arms, hands, their two heads, right? Um, and even the folds in their their uh, dresses. And, and this is the uh, tent uh, ceiling, I guess, the curtain, maybe. It's hard to tell uh, inside the tent. Um, so it's a lot of rhythm and it's mostly stable. Look carefully. I mean, her uh, arms are dynamic, but she's, she's still mostly, this is a straight line and her servant is so, and the table is definitely stable, but then there is the curved line of the fabric behind them. So it's both. Yeah. And all the lines are thin, thin outlines. Largest mass is her, then the maid servant. And then the, you could just say the the tent behind them, the fabric behind them. It's not clear if that's part of the, the roof of the tent or not. Uh, and then we have the um, <clears throat> balance. Yes, I think it is, but it depends on how you break it down. If you break it down like this, right, is a diagonal, her upper body, right, is about equal to her lower body. And that area roughly equals from the sword to the top of her head, the, the whole body of the kneeling um, maidservant. I see it as roughly balanced. And then this here, right, this fabric is roughly equal to the area of the table, which you can't see here, but it's got cloth going all the way down. So it's roughly balanced, left to right, top to bottom. Um, and then we have already the cement texture, superb as it would be in all Renaissance paintings, strong, realistic textures on the dress, on the um, skin, the hair, and again, the, the tent fabric, I guess. Um, and, and then let's see, am I forgetting something? Oh, colors and space. Yeah. The color of her dress is warm and her servants is cool. Uh, and of course their skin tones are warm and is the tent fabric, but that table is mostly cool. And of course, uh, the top of the servants head is <laughs> covered in a cool white cloth as are her sleeves. So it's both. And then for space, you have overlapping for shortening. And I would say there's diminishing size of, from the optics on the tabletop, but that's it. There's no other techniques for space. Okay, one last thing. You don't have to write this. 
uh, the fact that her hand is well away from the candle would fool some people into thinking that, oh, well, this painter got it wrong. She made a mistake. The shadow uh, couldn't be there. No, there's a light coming from outside the tent because of the, all these, uh, you know, you don't have to know any of this. Th these armies would have, of course, had fires burning outside their tents to keep, you know, so at night, if they had to go back and forth between the tents, you know, and deliver messages, whatever, obviously they're not gonna stumble around in the dark. So it's a light from outside that's coming into the interior of the tent that's causing the shadow on her face there. She can see better here. Yeah, and that's her, by the way. Most people, historians think that's an actual image of her face. Anyway, the movie you might wanna see, it's a pretty powerful film, really well acted. And yes, it has subtitles because it's a foreign film. I think Italian and French combined. It's called just Artemisia. It was made about 10 years ago and it's a very accurate portrayal of what happened to her and how she became such a talented painter. Okay, um, so we are now going to see the next must know, which is the Garden of Love. But I am going to give you a little background. So first, let's look at the must know, write the title, and then you should start taking notes about the meaning because the other three slides I just passed up, we're going to go back and look at it and they will tell us who was Rubens. Rubens was a very important painter during this period of the Baroque. So the title of this slide, the next must know is Garden of Love, just like it sounds, Garden of Love. And Rubens is R-U-B-E-N-S and the date is 1638. Okay, Rubens was the most successful painter in Northern Europe. That's the safe way to say it. You might think it was Rembrandt, but Rembrandt struggled. And next week when we get to Rembrandt, it might give you some emotional, it does me, it almost brings tears to my eyes to, to know, even after all these years, when I stop to think what he suffered, he suffered a lot. And I'll explain why and how that happened to him. Even though he was successful, he never was wealthy. Well, briefly he was, yeah, there was one period earlier in his career, but he lost everything and I'll explain all that next week. Not so Rubens. So here's what you should write about. Rubens, I'll say it again, was the most successful and wealthiest, both. I mean, the two don't always go together, right? But in this case they did. Again, he was the most successful and wealthiest painter in Northern Europe during his lifetime, which is early Baroque. Baroque goes from, you don't have to know the years, but 1600, roughly when it started, to about 1750. And you can see this is early 1600s, right? So in his lifetime, he was the most successful and wealthiest painter in Northern Europe. Why? How? Well, his talent, yes, but there, he also had the good fortune to marry well or wealthy women twice, not at the same time, which is all part of the meaning. His first wife, they had, I think it was five or six children, just say several children. They really were in love. Luckily for him, he was just starting his career as a painter and she was well connected and wealthy. And so during their marriage, uh, she got him a lot of commissions. But of course, pretty soon he became so famous, he didn't need anyone to help him. She died, I think in childbirth, pretty sure it was in childbirth. Anyway, young, in her 30s, even back then that was young for someone to die. Uh, and she would, you know, just the love of his life. He, he, he actually temporarily thought about I don't know about suicide, probably not, but he definitely was depressed to say that, depressed for well over a year after she died. And then after a while, I think 18 months or so, less than two years later after his first wife died, at some social event he met, I think she was the wealthiest woman in, in, in um, Holland. In any case, one of the wealthiest women in his country, which it wasn't a country then, it was under Spanish rule. So just say in his region, okay? which is in Northern Europe, you know, what is today the country of actually Belgium is what it's called. Uh, so he met, just to keep it simple, say he met an even wealthier woman and they fell in love. And again, it was a genuine love match. There was no, you know, it was no business arrangement. They really loved each other and he had more children with her and his career got even more <laughs> successful. And uh, so this is why he was married to a second wife, this painting here. This depicts wealthy people having not an orgy, you don't want to say that. That wouldn't be correct. That'd be overstating it. But let's just say hookups. Okay, how would you know whatever word you want to use that fits with the modern, you know, lingo. But in essence, that's what's happening here. These are Cupids. 
You see them? The baby angels that make people, fall, human beings fall in love ever since ancient Greek and Roman mythology. They are shooting their arrows, or in this case, I love this one. This guy's pushing this couple together so that they will fall in love. And this woman, look at her face. She really wants to have an arrow shot through her heart. So what, she'll fall in love with the next man she sees? I don't know, or, or perhaps a woman, you know, after all that was happening, of course, throughout history. So, but these people here are all wealthy. You can tell by their clothing, but if that's not enough, they have a fake ruin. It's called a mock ruin on their property. Whoever the owner of this, we don't know which, it's probably painted on his wife's estate because it was multiple acres and acres, like, I don't know, 100 acres. It was just a huge estate. And so he could just stay there and do landscapes, but that's not what he wanted. He wanted to paint scenes of people grouped portraits, if you want to call it that. So these are all real people that uh, he and his wife knew, and uh, they probably were invited to their estate, uh, Rubens and his wife's estate. Anyway, this is typical of only the wealthiest family. I mean, you have enough money to waste to blow on building a fake ruin of a Roman temple on your on your uh, land. You, you got to be pretty wealthy. And then they have their own private fountain. You see that here? Let me get rid of this. There, let's get that. Why is that? Oh, yeah, this is this where I can... Let's get that out of the way. There we go. See this fountain? Let's go up close. <laughs> it's still in the way. Yeah, you can see it's it's ornate, fancy, Baroque style fountain. I mean, talk about Baroque. Again, remember, that's a major fact or uh, set of facts. Those four features we've now covered it so many times. You should have them clearly in your notes. The bulbous shapes, everything is the, the mock ruin, at least the columns are their clothing, their hats, I mean, the baby angels, right? And of course, an encrustation ornamentation is absolutely the way people dress back then, but it's even true on the columns. See that? I mean, columns don't normally, in a real Greek or Roman temple, they wouldn't be decorated with these bands of carving, uh, uh, horizontal like that, that's added ornament, an encrustation of ornamentation. And of course, the unseen presence is, uh, you could say the God of, or the, you know, state of being in love. And the intense emotion is uh, romantic attraction, uh, you know, and you, you could say erotic even, because he was implying these people were going to get together as couples after the party or later on. And uh, like this couple here, for instance, and they were going to get to know each other better. I just leave it at that in the biblical sense. So there, it's not meant to be, subtle enough that people can't tell that there are going to be some uh, pairing off some coupling some some uh, hookups however you want to write that you see this couple here right so it's of course partly a sign of his joy uh in life because like i said he was I mean, there's no other word for it. Very lucky that he happened to meet these two women at the right time in his life that helped his career and also gave him a happy family and uh, introduced him to all these well-to-do people who hired him as a painter. But there is a little more to his career. So I'm going to go back to, or to, to, to who he was. Yeah, look at that. And this is a painting. I took this photo. You don't have to know. This is not the must know. But you should write this fact. Okay, you see some more baby angels. He loved to paint mythical figures around the borders of his paintings. That's one of his signature motifs. So you should know that as part of the meaning. Of course, we already saw the baby cupids. Well, cupids are baby angels. So you don't have to say baby cupids. The cupids were there. These may be not cupids. They don't have arrows. They don't look like they're trying to make anyone fall in love. But this is a scene from the Jewish temple, a scene out of the Bible, the arrival of the Ark of Covenant. You see it's being carried into the Jewish temple right there. Right, this would be when it was first created a piece of gold, you know, a box with sculpture above it, and inside of it, you don't have to know any of that. Of course, uh, inside would have been broken pieces of the Ten Commandments, according to the Bible. And here's the head rabbi, I believe I have that right, and that him here. Well, no, that's probably him there because they're sacrificing a lamb, yeah, so that's him there. And then the other two signature motifs that he used in all his paintings, including this one here, uh, are a circular emotion, or sorry, circular placement, concentric, sorry, I misspoke, concentric, circles within circles. The outer border of uh, baby angels here, cherubs, forms one kind of a, you see they're down here too and at the corner. So that forms one kind of circle, an outer circle. Then you have a slightly smaller one or somewhat smaller one that's all the heads of these people form. And then you get to the tight 
inner circle of these see these heads here so he did that with the placement of his of his figures he created uh, concentric circles with the placement of the main figures in his paintings and then the third thing he did that was really his own special unique technique is a soft but strong modeling combined with bold outlines you see the bold outlines when you see around the baby's butts <laughs> and this rabbi is obviously another rabbi around his robes right and around some of the other figures. So not every object has a bold outline, but he often would take the main objects or many of the main objects or figures in his paintings were painted with a soft but strong modeling combined with bold outline. And that is a very distinctive look. That is a Rubens look to his paintings. So finishing up with a formal analysis. Oh, I, I, you might wanna see, yeah, look at that, it's a nice detail. You see somewhat of what I'm talking about, about the soft but realistic modeling, right? And then I see there isn't as much bold outline here, but there is around this, the main rabbi, and around the, definitely in the entire Ark of Covenant, that whole object has bold outline. But this might gross some of you out, but it's Bacchus, the god of wine, the ancient Greek and Roman god of wine. And he depicted him as as his unappealing a figure as he could make him and we have a drunken lion we have another sheriff here literally just waiting to get right the over spilling of wine from above and then my favorite detail is this little boy here who is obviously relieving himself after having too much wine right in front of the uh, man and woman and this woman popping out of her dress and then this man here which obviously he's half human and half, you see that um, the mythical creature of a, a satyr, right? <clears throat> totally just guzzling wine. So it's meant to show what happens to you if you overindulge in, of course, addictive behaviors like alcoholism. Okay, so let's do our formal analysis on this painting. Um, it is balanced, I think, although uh, there are people who argue that that's empty sky so yeah you know now when i look at it again i haven't looked at this painting in a couple of years okay i'll revise that i apologize i should have said it's somewhat if not clearly unbalanced toward the right because of the number of figures and the solid background of the uh, fountain the edge of the fountain and the uh, walls of this mock ruin and on this side there is empty space even though there are trees that sky obviously uh, for space, you have all the techniques, pretty much all of them here, except register line. Of course, only ancient art did that. Ancient Egyptians and, and uh, Greeks did that, or Babylonians, I should say. So you have diminishing size, obviously, of the human figures as they go farther into distance. You have, of course, overlapping. Uh, you have scientific perspective. There is a vanishing point. You can't see it, but you're behind the walls of the mock temple. There's obviously foreshortening. You see it on the fountain, on the mock ruin there. And there is atmospheric perspective. See it in this, the objects, the trees and bushes and the clouds in the background. So it's got all the five main techniques of realistic depiction of space. They're all here. The rhythm is obvious. All the hands, heads, arms, legs, dresses, cupids in the sky. Semiotic texture, again, is sharp and realistic, but the modeling, in, in like her dress, has that kind of slightly soft look and you even notice it on the faces of some of these figures and then the bold outline is limited to only sort of like this man's robes or cape and uh, her uh, i would say his face certainly uh, it's there's less obvious bold outline on this one than that last painting i showed you he did of the temple the jewish temple but it's here there's some around her dress for instance so soft but realistic modeling and sh sharp but realistic cement textures everywhere um, and then we have the colors of course alternating warm cool you guys can do this i think on your own by now but uh, i will briefly touch on each of the nine elements as we uh, move on to the next slide warm cool <laughs> cool warm warm <laughs> cool warm cool warm Okay, alternate. He did that a lot too, but that's nothing new. Other painters have done that. Uh, and then the largest mass is probably the mock ruin in the background. Or if you count this whole group as one solid mass from the edge of this woman's, you know, head to this man's 
you know, standing figure, if that's one body uh, or mass of all, all those bodies, you might say that's the largest mass. You, I leave you flexibility. I've, I've done that and I will on the papers about which things you think make the largest mass. It's, it's a matter of personal interpretation. Uh, and let's see. I, oh, it's dynamic. Yes. Oh, the only thing stable uh, are maybe the columns and the edges of the walls on the temple. Although this couple is standing upright, they're kind of leaning over, and certainly he is. Uh, so, you know, there's some stability to this woman, but those are small portions. Most of the human figures are, are diagonals, leaning, right? And then the round columns, of course, and this leaning tree. So it's mostly uh, dynamic. Yes, please. Question. Question? No. Oh, okay. I thought I heard a question. I was gonna. Um, yeah. You answered the question, but I was gonna ask: it, Would you consider this mostly dynamic with a few stable elements? Yes, exactly. With you the tree it. and the temple. Yes, you put it just right. Exactly. Okay, we have one more. By the way, this is another Rubens painting. None of us know, but you can see the bulbous, rounded shapes he's using on the nude figure. That's supposed to be Neptune and his sea nymphs that accompanied him when he appeared up out of the water, right? And this is just a silly painting. I've seen it. It's in, it's in uh, Paris on the walls of one of the palaces in, in Paris, actually, in Luxembourg Palace. And this is the king, uh, of sorry, ooh, a princess who was about to marry the king of France and become, therefore, queen of France. She was from Italy, and she had just made the trip by boat uh, to whatever harbor. This is Marseille, I think it is, yet in southern France. So it's not a big moment in history. I mean, it's just a royal wedding. I mean, it's not like, you know, Diana and whatever, yeah, Kate. They didn't have worldwide TV coverage or anything, but he's trying to pump it up into something important because it's his clients. They hired him, the royal family of France, to paint her arrival as though it was one of the most important events in the history of Europe. <laughs> but hey, it's a patron paying you, so you can do what they ask, right? Okay, uh, we uh, still need to go. We're going to go to the last one. I'm going to go very, very, very fast. I didn't mean to. This is a really important one. I sometimes start with it, and I probably should have, but uh, it happened to be placed at the end, and you see I have it near the bottom here of this. This is the calling, or last must know for night. Very important slide, not cutting the study list. So good. I'm glad to see the person. I can tell by the numbers who was temporarily away from the phone. Good thing you rejoined us because this is very important painting. It has a high possibility of being on the midterm. I won't be cutting it. This. It's called The Calling of Saint or just Calling of Saint Matthew. And that's with two T's. M-A-A-T-T-H-E-W. The artist's name, Caravaggio. C-A-R-A-V-A-G-G-I-O. Caravaggio. 1602. This is considered by many people to be the first truly Baroque painting, period. See why it's so important. If it's the first Baroque painting, it starts a whole new movement, a whole new 150 year long style of painting. Other artists, including Rembrandt and Rubens and all the other painters we've seen tonight, Velasquez, were influenced by this man. He is considered the first fully Baroque, or you could say truly Baroque painter, and many historians consider this actual painting to be the first truly Baroque painting. It has all four of the elements we've been talking about, but I'll, you know, summarize them as we look at this for the meaning, of course. Now, this view isn't the what you see. When you look at this painting, it's on the wall of a church in Rome. I've been there. You cannot see these two figures, so I'm going to go ahead to a view that's more like what you see with that's an overly enhanced, so is this one, uh, view, you know, artificially for us to be able to see the details. But this is closer to what you see. So you can't even see the face very much unless you really concentrate. And the upper body is of, G this is Jesus and Peter coming into, this is the scene. The meaning of it is a scene from the Bible in which Jesus and his first disciple, you have to always his first, you can just say Peter one of his disciples, you can keep some of it. It's supposed to be Peter, the first one who joins Jesus, wants this man to join them. But there are people who think that this is Matthew. Mm, I have a problem with that. And so did the historians I talked to in Rome. Matthew was a young man. This guy is not a young man. I don't think so. This man is. And plus which Matthew was the tax collector for the Romans in Jerusalem. So, of course, his job would be to count the money. 
So this guy's the one counting the money. So I, and then when this man's pointing, it's hard to tell if his finger's pointing to himself or this way. And most historians I've talked to think it's the latter, that he's saying, what? You want our boss, right, Matthew, if that is Matthew, the young guy at the end, to give up a life of luxury? Because, of course, he gets to keep part of the taxes. Of course, tax collectors, at least in the old days, they kept part of the taxes they collected. So he's, you know, living a high life. You want him to give up his life of luxury to go beg in the streets with you? What are you, crazy? So there's shock and reaction of disbelief. That's the intense emotion here among the people at the table. All of them look surprised and uh you know full of uh disbelief or even shock it's not too strong a word so there's your intense emotion the bulbous shapes well where where isn't there a bulbous shape except the wall of course there their you know clothing their hats right uh and even to some degree their poses the way they're hunched and leaning over these two figures at least and this guy here and then the unseen presences are most you can't say all of but most of the bodies of jesus and peter they are in such deep shadow that when you stand in front of the actual painting, you can barely see them. You can barely see them. These have been enhanced. And in some ways, I wish that uh, this wasn't what the slide librarian shows, but I, I appreciate her, you know, making copies for us to use in this class. So you can see the detail more, but the actual painting, it, it, you could barely make out that there are two men and the far right of the painting. And then this is a new technique invented by um, Caravaggio. And every other Baroque artist used it at some point in their career, the famous ones. I call it the spotlight effect. I don't think I've seen that. In, well, maybe I have in some textbook somewhere, but I've been using that term for, oh, 25 years to describe his technique of making the light come from one end or direction you can say one corner of the scene, if you want to put that one, for one direction, intensely lighting up only one part of the painting. Remember, I did that with his faces, right? The, his, his portraits of people's faces, where half of their face was in shape. You, you know what I'm talking about, some of you. If not, you'll see it next week when we look at Rembrandt's work. So what you have here is what he invented, a new technique for the way this is an extreme use of contrasting light and shadow. The unseen or nearly unseen, you could just say nearly unseen presence of Jesus and Peter, a part of what makes it just traditionally Baroque. And some people credit this guy, Caravaggio, with inventing that, the idea of the unseen presence. Mm -hmm. That we can't prove, but we can prove that he invented the idea of a spotlight effect. There were no spotlights then, so he used some kind of candle device. Who, actually, they even know what he did, but you don't need to know the details. So this lighting, artificial lighting that he's creating here, is focusing our attention on the people at the table who of course are the intended right target of jesus's pointing you see how they're saying you can't you can't mean you want him to leave us uh and go out in the street because these guys were beggars you know homeless right jesus and all his disciples they never had a permanent home the whole time they were together uh so one last thing about caravaggio he, in one way, he's a little bit like uh, Bernini, and he also had a violent uh, temper, and he also got into fights. He killed at least two men in Rome in bar fights. He would go to dives, bars that were really down in the nastiest neighborhoods, and back then there were some pretty, <laughs> pretty uh, dangerous parts of Rome already by then. And that's what he's depicting here. Look at that window. Look at the scum on that window and the wall. Every bodily fluid known to the human race would have been deposited on that wall. That's what he's implying, because that's the kind of place he hung out at. And that was an insult to the Catholic Church in a way, because Jesus is... is, is but then he explained it by saying, oh, no, he's just trying to get this guy, this young guy, Matthew, to leave this environment and come out in the streets where, you know, of course, he'll be in the sun and the fresh air. <laughs> I don't know. He obviously didn't say exactly that, but he would have explained it by saying, well, this is just showing the contrast between the purity of Jesus and the immoral setting or environment that Matthew was in as a tax collector. He would stop in these bars to collect his and count his money and get drunk, probably, and find someone to sleep with, right? And the actual painter did that a lot. He would go to dive bars looking for a lover. Uh, he was bisexual, by the way. Uh, and he would uh, get into fights and he ended up killing two people. Caravaggio. The Pope actually ordered him to be arrested and, and would have executed him for the second murder. 
uh, but he uh, ran away. It's the last part of the meeting. He ran away from Rome, you could say escaped, before he was arrested. And he died alone on a beach at age 40 on the coast of Italy. It's a tragic story. But this wasn't, you know, someone else doing something to him. It was his own uh, excessive behavior and uh, violent temper that caused his, his own early death. And he was one of the greatest painters, well, the greatest painter in Italy at that time. So there's plenty for you to write about the meaning. That's the so one. Please, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Like, so he died on the way to where? Well, he left Rome and he went to southern Italy. I think he went to Sicily. You don't have to know it. So he went to, you know, hundreds of miles south of Rome. Italy's a long, narrow country. You know, you, you've seen it on a map. So he, he escaped from the papal grasp. You know what I'm saying? The Pope couldn't control all of Italy. There was no Italy back then. You know this, right? There was no countries. <laughs> well, sort of England was already starting, but there were just a bunch of separate warring kingdoms. So he was uh, given protection in some other kingdom in Southern Italy. I don't remember where. Away from Rome, hundreds of miles south of Rome for a while, but he wanted to go back and the Pope was going to forgive him. That I forgot that detail. The Pope actually sent a letter to, to whatever that kingdom was to tell Caravaggio, I forgive you. Um, after, you know, whatever, two years of exile or something, you can come back and we will allow you to paint again, which of course he, any successful painter wants to keep painting. So he was about to return. I don't remember how and why he died on the way of exposure and hunger or maybe it was uh, alcoholism. I, it was some combination of things. It was tragic. He, he literally drove himself into an early grave with his uh, violent behavior and breaking the law, of course, and also the exile and his lack of, he lost all his income, of course, while he was on the run. You know, he had no stable place to live uh, or income. So he might even have died of some combination of hunger and, uh, you know, illness and exposure. He died alone on a beach uh, in southern Italy, on the coast of Italy, at age 40. On his way back to Rome, he was heading back to Rome, but he didn't make it, sadly. Okay, let's uh, do the formal analysis here. Okay, this is balance left to right, no question. You know, if you draw the line right down here, of course, three figures, three figures, but obviously unbalanced toward the bottom. The colors mucus green is what I call it. You could even think of other things that might be on the wall, but I won't go there. Uh, on the on the window glass, I mean, it's grotesque. You wouldn't want to touch any of that, right? Uh, probably get an affection from it. Is it warm? Uh, <laughs> pardon? Is it warm? No. Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, it depends on which version of this you look at, but I've seen the painting. No, it's mucus green. Green would be a cool color. It's not yellowish green, in other words. It's a cool green, yeah. The window glass and the wall. So the background, the room, the wall of the room itself is cool. But uh, the human figures, most of the clothing is warm. You know, Peter's robes, Jesus' sleeve, that's all you can see of his clothes. Uh, and uh, at least some parts of these three, including, I'm almost certain that this is Matthew because he wasn't the old, he was the one of the youngest disciples. So it makes sense this was him there. In any case, the details of the feathers in this guy's outfit, at least his sleeves and his stockings, that's what they're called, right? Are cool. So it's a mixture, but I don't think you'll say there's more cool than warm or the other way around. It's just a mixture of cool and warm. All of the lines here are thin outline. This super realistic semi texture is everywhere on the hair, the face, the clothing, and even on the wall and the window. Uh, very strong and realistic uh, textures and, and uh, also the modeling. The modeling is sharp and realistic, but don't forget it with your, if, you, if it's on the exam, it, you have to analyze it. When it comes to modeling, that's what this is. This is an extreme form of chiaroscuro. Remember, I already gave you that definition. That word will come up for sure somewhere on the midterm. Remember, we're reviewing next week, the second half. So when we finish with Baroque, and take our break. Don't disappear. You want to be there so you'll know which slides are being cut from the study list and how to study, how the test will be graded, because the test is two weeks from tonight. Um, okay, so what you have here is uh, extreme modeling, but that's the right word for it is chiaroscuro, uh, because you've got high, high contrast between uh, shadow and light, the spotlight effect. 
So that's part of the modeling, but on the individual figures, it's just normally sharp, realistic modeling like earlier Renaissance paintings always had. Is it stable or dynamic? I'd say some of both because the walls clearly are stable or wall and window. Um, and uh, Jesus is standing up, right? His arm is out, what we can see of it. Uh, but this guy's leaning over, this guy's sitting upright. And so it's a mixture because of course, if this is Matthew, let's just assume that that is, he's leaning over and this man is uh, looking uh, at a diagonal. So it's a mixture of stable dynamic details. What's the largest mass? That's easy, the wall. <laughs> and then it's this group of people if you take them as a single mass. And then I guess it's Peter's upper body. Uh, if you count that as a single mass, because you can just see from about his, what, what about his waist or stomach to the top of his shoulders, really. Uh, and then after that is Jesus's, the end of Jesus's arm, I guess, is the fourth largest mass. <laughs> All right. And then um, the rhythm is obvious with the um, clothing, you know, those puffy sleeves, right? The um, bulbous rounded shapes obviously are here. And um, the uh, unseen presence, I already covered that, right? Uh, incrustation of ornamentation is more obvious as you get up close, you know, with the clothing and, you know, the, the, the feathers in their caps, right? And even the hair to, uh, styles to some degree. Um, <clears throat> so the, the rhythm is obvious, you know, hats, hair, arms, um, and, and the window creates rhythm here. And for space, you have overlapping, foreshortening on the table and I guess the shutter, yeah. And I don't know if you can say there's diminishing size, I don't see it. So just that overlapping and foreshortening and this scene is so close up inside the room that there's no need for any other techniques to uh, depicting space on this particular scene. I'm going to go ahead and show you a couple others for your own, because of the way this works, unless it's, I don't think it's changed. When you get to the end, By the way, if you go to this church in Rome, you can look it up. I mean, I don't remember the name of it. I just remember waiting in line to get in. You have to bring a thousand lira coin. That's about the equivalent of a dollar, dollar fifty, depending on what time it is, what you know, what the exchange rate is. But it's it's a significant amount of money, at least for a lot of people in Italy, to put into a coin-operated light. You don't have to write this. Uh, light that shines on the painting long enough for you to see some of the details, but even then you don't see Jesus and Peter here very well because the original painting is not this bright. It's not faded, it's just the way the artist painted it. And this is, you know, uh, what's the word? Uh, electronically enhanced this image. It's almost um, photoshopped, you could say, the, the, these slides here. Um, so I, I've looked at it that way. And if you don't bring enough money and you're just starting to look at it, the light goes off. It only is on for 60 seconds. That's how the church makes money. They make thousands of dollars a week that way from tourists putting these, the largest coin there is in Italian money is a thousand lira coin. You said, I think so. Yeah. And it's a little bit like a silver dollar, only much bigger. And you have to put it in this slot. And then this, this ancient machine, probably from the 1950s, goes, you know, and it has a timer, obviously. One minute you got to look at the painting. And, and you're not supposed to hold up the line. But if you want to risk the ire and anger of the people behind you, you put a second coin in and get two minutes. That's what I did. People were glaring at me. But I had only one chance to see it. It's worth the trip. So I'm going to now go way back. We're going to see all these next week to two others. And then we will do... Uh, a recap just of that one must know I didn't uh, get to and then take questions. But here we go. Here are the other, uh, I don't know why they're separated. This is what the slide library did. Two more paintings, not must know. I just want you to, to, to listen and, and uh, you know, kind of, I think you'll find interesting, uh, absorb or take in this aspect of who he was. Uh, Caravaggio was um, actually more uh, homosexual in his uh, amorous relationships. He had some intense relations with women, but mostly with men. And he, again, was one who, if it wasn't for his talent and his fame and his success, the Catholic Church would have had him arrested and put in prison, if not tortured, because it was against their rules, right? And the laws, even at that time in Rome, in the city of Rome, maybe would have had the government of the city arrested. But they couldn't touch him because he was so important to them. They really 
liked his paintings and you can see he did them for churches and, and uh, popes and uh, bishops. Uh, but this is something he did of one of his lovers, a young um, uh, model that he had found in one of those dive bars. And it's called Boy Bitten by a Lizard. See, you don't see the lizard. That's the unseen presence, unless you get really close. And of course, the intense emotion is pain, physical pain. Bulbous, well, you couldn't get more bulbous. Look at it, his lips, his nose, the flower in his hair and the way his hair is, you know, styled almost looks like, you know, a fancy, uh, you know, 17th century woman's hairstyle. And even the robes, the folds of the robes and his shoulder. And the incrustation ornamentation is clearly there too. You have to write it of course, on the table, all the objects, you know, the fruits and vegetables and flowers and things. Uh, and the unseen presence is, is probably Caravaggio himself. They were, you know, living together. And uh, at some point they broke up. I don't remember the reason. And then we have, this is really interesting. About five years later, same model either was still with Caravaggio, so he probably at least had a five-year-long relationship, or he came back to him. Five years later, this is girl playing a lute. A lute is an early form of well, almost like an early guitar or mandolin, and that's this musical instrument. And that is him as he's dressed for this painting as the model, as, as a woman, when it's actually, at least just most historians believe that it's the same person. There's evidence to back that up, though it's not 100% certain. And there you have it on the table, again, an incrustation ornamentation, the table is all engraved, carved, and decorated, as uh, are the musical instruments to some degree and, and the musical books on the table, right? And then the puffy, obviously, um, bulbous rounded look is everywhere you look on. The clothing and on her cheeks or his cheeks. I'm not sure at this point if we know for sure that it was the same guy, but the evidence is pretty strong. And there's no question the emotion is love. They really did love each other. There's plenty of evidence of that. And, uh, you know, no, no uncertainty. He didn't like take advantage, in other words, of somebody. It's even though this guy was younger at the time he met him. At that time, the age of consent, if it was even uh, 14 I'd be surprised it probably was 13 or 14 that was at the time legally the age of consent in most of Europe surprisingly in a way but that was the way the laws were then so he this model was older than that when they first met and then stayed together for at least several years okay and I think after that we're going to do this I'm going to do this quickly if you've already heard it and you have no questions of course you can say uh, your good night here and just go ahead and do what you got to do. But but I do think it uh, it's incumbent on me to do it over for those who will watch this as a video. And that'll be the last slide we'll look at tonight uh, since it didn't get recorded. Again, this is the Colonnade of St. Peter's, the first one on tonight's uh, list uh, in, in the order they, they are listed as week five, right? C O L. O N N A D E, Colonnade of St. Peter's, apostrophe S. Bernini, of course, it's B E R N I N I, 1657. Bernini again was the most famous of all Baroque artists of any kind. That means he not only did one type of art, but he actually did about uh, a dozen pieces of architecture you know, designing buildings and plazas, like this is a plaza we'll talk about in a minute. So he was an architect and a sculptor, but he was most famous for his sculpture at his public plazas, you know, where a fountain would be and he designed the whole plaza around it. So he's both an architect and a sculptor and he was, uh, he was extremely talented as a sculptor, a little less talented as an architect, we'll get to that. But for now, let's just focus on what is this site? That's St. Peter's, which is the mother church of the Catholic uh, sect or you can say Catholic religion if you prefer. Uh, it's a portion of Christianity, of course. That is the mother church. It's the largest church in the world, but we're not, if it's on the exam, this is a slide you'll see, you won't be talking about that. And I'll remind you of that if this slide is on the screen and you have 15 minutes to write about it, which is how the test will be given. We'll review for that, of course, next week. So all you focusing on for uh, both the meaning and the formal analysis is the colonnades. There are actually two of them, but they just, call it, yeah, I believe it's just one 
Yeah, for some reason they they just say colonnade every time it's listed. It really should say colonnades plural because each one is a separate structure. But they are in front of St. Peter's, which you could mention as the mother church of the Catholic religion. And the plaza they um, surround, right, here is one of the largest plazas in Europe. You can't say in the whole world, but certainly in Europe, it's one of the largest. It can hold up to 200,000 people when it's fully crowded. And then these columns are shaped this way in these two curving arms, quite literally, they look like arms because the design Bernini said was meant to symbolize the arms of the mother church enfolding the faithful or embracing is a better word, embracing the faithful. In other words, if you come here, you're supposed to feel welcomed as though, you know, the church symbolically with these, you know, stone columns ranged like curved arms is, is embracing you. I mean, it's, it's a very, you know, evocative image and, and thought. Okay, what makes it Baroque? And remember, I'll repeat this, the four features that make something Baroque, and they're all here. One is an encrustation of ornamentation. So let's look at that with this other slide. That's all these statues. He put over 200 statues on top of the of uh, each or above. I don't mean on top, above each column. They're on top of the roof, of course, that's the roof of the colonnade, obviously. So above each column, there's over 200 saints, Catholic saints. And they are ornate. They've got fancy clothing on, their hairdos are fancy, uh, you know, and all the details on their face. So those are one of the features of Baroque architecture is an encrustation of ornamentation. Clearly that applies to the statues that are visible here uh, above the colonnade. Now let's go back to the full view. Uh, it's bulbous and, and uh, rounded. Well, obviously <laughs> this is as bulbous and rounded as you can get these two curved arms of stone, right? Uh, and then we have the unseen presence would be God and or the Pope. Uh, most people would say the Pope because the Pope lives here and the Pope would come speak to the crowds ser several times a year whenever it was an important religious holiday. So you could say the unseen presence. If he appears there though, then you'd say it's more God, you know, because then your Pope would be talking to you about God. So you could say God or the Pope is the unseen presence. The intense emotion is religious devotion. There we go, intense emotion. Uh, you're supposed to feel here is religious devotion, both to the Catholic Church and to, and to uh, the belief in God. Okay, and then we have the fact that there's this empty space here because Bernini, it's the last fact about the meaning, intended or had actually did design two towers, one on each corner. And this is later, all this stuff was filled in later in the 1600s, about the time he was uh, actually just after he finished the colonnades. Uh, he thought he was a great architect, so he decided he could uh, design two over 300 foot tall towers. It would have been as tall as the dome, which is actually against the law now in, in Rome. You can't make a building taller than that dome. I mentioned that, remember when we had the slides of Michelangelo's dome. The law in Rome forbids that, but back then that wasn't such a law. So he's going to make uh, towers that were even taller than the dome on each uh, corner, but he didn't listen to his own um, staff. They advised him against, and one of them was named Borromini. I've already covered Borromini's architecture. Uh, later on, they became rivals, bitter rivals. Uh, but at the time he was working Borromini, just say one of the assistants working for Bernini, uh, more than one, but one of them was Borromini, who later became a famous architect. But while he was working in that office or studio, it wasn't an office, they called him studio, the architecture studio of Bernini. He and others warned Bernini, you can't make the tower that tall, that heavy, it will collapse. And sure enough, roughly halfway through the construction, when it was about halfway up, the tower collapsed one day with no warning and killed 25 people that were inside and working on it at the time. So that uh, kind of proves that Bernini wasn't such a great architect, at least not as great an architect as he was a uh, sculptor. Okay, formal analysis, it's dynamic, of course, but then the columns are stable individually, right? So it's both, but the overall shape of these curved arms and even this row of columns here, uh, which is, actually these aren't columns, that's right. These are rooms attached, but he did design this too. So you could include that as part of the design because it is all by Bernini. 
that look at how they flare outward. They're, they're at a diagonal. So the whole thing is dynamic in shape, but the details of the columns are stable. The modeling is just the natural shadows from the sun underneath the roof. Uh, the rhythm is obvious. The columns, the statues, and the two curved arms on the uh, shape of the whole colonnade. Okay, and then for space, it's the columns are just uh, just under 50 feet. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's like 46 to 48 feet. So just say almost or nearly 50 foot tall columns. So it's real space, right? There's no techniques for space. And the plaza that they uh, encompass or surround can hold up to 200,000 people. Those are the features of the real space. The colors are warm on the roof, the red clay tile, and uh, cool on the off-white of the columns. The textures are the real smooth texture uh, of the uh, tiles on the roof and the marble, the columns are marble, but there is simulated texture done with carved line on the statues, which you can't see in this picture and you won't have to describe them, but you just should know those are statues. So of course they have carved line on their faces and their clothing. Um, and then the largest mass, well, I would say it's the columns, unless you count the roof as a single mass. And then I guess that would be the case, each of the two roof lines, then the columns and then the statues in that order. Um, and again, I already covered the lines, uh, balanced rhythm. Uh, yeah, it's balanced. It's totally symmetrical. Okay, any questions now? Because that's uh, the last slide Then I'm going to do as, a, as a lecture notes for people who need to review. Of course, you may want to review even if you watch this live the first time or just again. But anybody has any questions about anything we covered tonight or about your papers at this point? Um, just two questions about um, the terms. So first, the four main features of uh, Barrow art. Is that how you pronounce Baroque, it? Baroque. Baroque. Here's a way to remember. If it ain't Baroque, don't fix it. That's an old okay. joke from one of my college professors. <laughs> yeah, so what I have written down is encrustation of ornamentation is the first one. Correct. Yeah. Bulbous features or structures to be the second. Bulbous and, shapes. Yeah, but you can say features if you want, but I'd say shapes because it's... Okay. Um, an unseen presence with right. it that's supposed to be represented somewhere within the art. Perfect. Excellent. And then a strong emotion depiction within the art as well. Depiction, or you can say within the art. Sure. Yeah, that's well said. Those those are all work. Yeah, I'm not going to hold you to regurgitating these uh, definitions exactly as they are. It's just that, you know, when you see them on a slide that you're analyzing, you want to be able to apply that. And you got it. You, you got all four. That's well done. And um, there's one last thing. Sure, the, go the ahead. Turn below it. Gopura, have we covered that yet? No, no, no. That's for after the uh, midterm. So we're still on Baroque art next week. We cover Rembrandt, right? All right. And, uh, oh, and some of you know about, uh, um, let's see, Vermeer, right? Vermeer, very famous painter. Uh, anyway, so we cover uh, the later Baroque period. And then we take a break. And then we review for the midterm. And the midterm is two weeks from tonight. But your papers are due next week, don't forget. So of course you can still email me, but if you have questions I didn't already answer at the start of tonight, that's why I always stick around at the end of each lecture. Please uh, ask them now. But anyway, as far as your list goes, you've got, that's fine. If you wrote it, those phrases on, if this slide's on them or any other Baroque slide, uh, which are almost certainly will be at least one Baroque slide, and you use those four statements you gave me just now you you already have four of the six facts that you'll need on the meaning and then you could describe the actual structure or what the purpose is so all right you're you're on the right track it's well written well so all right you got it um one last thing sure did you give i i came in a bit late did you give like a comparison of pre-baroque art like something no i didn't but I, I can add that you know you don't need to know that i did sign a briefly kind of a hint at it but because that wasn't recorded that, that first few minutes i'll just say this that uh, you um you don't need to know a lot about uh their you know how they're different except the fact that baroque those four features you just read to back to me uh were not part of renaissance art most anyway, Renaissance art. So it's kind of like a late 
ornate, I like to say it that way, a late ornate phase of Baroque with some added things like the emotional component and the unseen presence. That's how I put it. I think I said that at the beginning, but it wasn't recorded. So it's a good question. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Because uh, there's, you know, we're still ending early. And oh, don't forget, if you didn't sign off yet, you guys do need to send your papers to me uh, as a PDF to Mark W at AOL. I will send an email to remind you because if they're not in PDF format, I might not be able to open them, let alone grade them. And if they're not sent to my AOL, they might go astray because the other website, the Outlook is so full of uh, spam and it's so complicated. And that's a PDF, not a yeah, PDF Word only. Doc, yes, not a Microsoft right. Word doc. Right, right, PDF. right. PDF because then my, either my, me or the readers will get some of them to grade. It's a college rule. I mean, it's requirement by the JC because they are the most accessible format of any type of files. Yes, PDF only, please. And with the wording I did describe, right? Now, if you want to, I can just, uh, let's go off of this here. Yeah, I think uh, I wrote it down somewhere that um, we had to title it a specific way when we submitted it to yes you. here uh i think you missed that so i will hold it up it is the last thing because that, this is helpful for the other students who were you know uh will be seeing this record. oh yeah so, i have that written down good yeah our 1.2 short paper number one uh, underline last name first name and please use the the name the exact name you use to enroll in the class and then that's a little hint about how to research, how to cite sources from the JC, our SRJC library website or link. Um, well, they have a website, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, well, the college website, and then obviously you can navigate from there to get to the library link. And then under that heading would be how to cite uh, sources if you don't already know. Okay, well, thank you for all your questions. You're in a small but dedicated group. I think you all benefit from this. And this will be posted for those who missed part of it or want to refresh your memory course. You, you may anyway, just for studying for the midterm by uh, 7 p.m. on Friday. So you can look at any time after 7 p.m. You'll be able to see uh, this whole lecture, which even though the first slide wasn't recorded, we just now did that. So nothing's missing from this uh, intended lecture. So next week, we're covering some pretty intense uh, artwork and some tragic life stories, especially when it comes to Rembrandt. What he had to deal with is is really kind of mind-boggling that he had to go through. I'll explain when we go. He overcame a lot of tragedy in his life and a lot of setbacks and uh, jealousy and other problems that he nonetheless is one of the most famous painters in the history of art, of course, now. But at the time he was uh, living in Amsterdam, we'll talk about this next week, uh, he had been famous and then he became almost forgotten before he died. I mean, not forgotten, but overlooked by the younger generation of painters and collectors and critics because they were already an art establishment that far back who decided who's the latest, you know, big name and who wasn't. That was already happening. There was mass media back then. It just wasn't electronic. So we'll talk about all of that next week. So, okay, you guys, any other questions? I think we covered everything and we ended early. Thank you all and good night, you guys. Take care. And I look forward to seeing your papers by Tuesday. You have until midnight. If you didn't get it done before class, you have until midnight for it not to be late. Uh, yes? can, I turn, can I turn in the rough draft tomorrow? Yeah, you can. Rough draft by Sunday at the latest, like not late, like five or six on Sunday or sooner, better is sooner. Yeah. Okay. And then you'll get a reply by. Uh, well, Sunday at the latest, probably sooner, probably by Saturday, uh, in a way within 24 hours. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Nope. Good all night. Right. Thank you all. Good night, you guys. Take care. Have a good week.